Welcome to the Unrest Podcast. I'm Caitlin Stansel. And I'm Madeline Green. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Unrest Podcast so you can stay up to date on all of our real life haunts. And today's is a doozy. We get to visit the land of Bigfoot again. (laughs) Caitlin, (laughs) tell us about this week's real life haunt. So we're taking you to Missouri where Alan said he and his wife had quite the experience out on a lonely road. Take a listen. My wife and I lived on a county road between Salem, Missouri and Rolla, Missouri, which is about 30 miles apart. And this county road went down. We were probably two miles down the county road, but there was only like four houses between the highway and our house. We lived halfway down a hill. There, there's a creek called the Dry Fork Creek that, uh, well, it's actually a pretty long creek. It's actually just a small stream, but uh, a lot of that stream is dry. It's a lose, what they call a losing stream here in Missouri. There are parts of it that goes underground And unless there's a real big rain, usually there's just different pools somewhere in the creek. But um, we lived about halfway down this hill toward the creek. And one weekend we were going to go someplace out of town. And so my wife was going to wash the car and clean it up and get some of the stuff packed that we'd be taking with us. And I had to run into town for something. And we never locked the door because there was never anybody on this county road. And it was out in the middle of the country. And uh, also, it was an old farmhouse that was built, I don't know, probably 1900, 1910, something like that. So there was no air conditioning. We always left the windows open, too. But I came, came back from town and the bucket and the hose and everything was still there, but I couldn't find her. So I went in the house and there was, there was only one bedroom and it was upstairs, but the whole upstairs was a bedroom because it was open. And I walked up there, which the first thing that kind of uh, made me think that something was kind of strange was that the door was locked. So I had to find my key and get in. And I noticed the windows were closed. But I got upstairs, and she had a. Uh, she was in bed under the covers, had the covers up to her nose, and she had a shotgun under the covers. And I was like, "What in the world are you doing?" But she said that she had heard something down by the creek, and she said it kept getting closer. It sounded like it was getting closer, but she never could see anything. And I said, "Well, what did it sound like?" And she said, well, it was kind of a cross between, maybe a cross between a scream and a moan. She said she'd never heard anything like it. And I said, well, was it cattle? Because there was some cattle down in there. And she said, no, because he he moved those out a couple of days ago, moved them to a different pasture. So I didn't really think anything of it. I was kind of kidding her. But then we got up to go to work the next morning, and it it was a spring day. And it was really, really windy. And it was still dark when we left for work. And I pulled out of the driveway and got up at the top of the hill. And the road kind of turned. There was like a little curve. And it was still pretty much dark. I mean, I had the headlights on. And as soon as we made that little turn in the road, the headlights hit this. It had to have been a Bigfoot because it was standing right in the middle of the road. And it really looked shocked that like somebody had caught it i mean i I don't know how to describe that it it just had a look of surprise and it it was windy and you could see the the hair was like blowing because it had pretty long hair but it wasn't the typical color that you usually see it was kind of a gray color 
and, and now I didn't get right up to it. I mean, but because by the time we got there, it had turned and stepped across a ditch and then stepped across a barbed wire fence. But from where we were at, I would have judged it to have been taller than my truck. And I had a four wheel drive truck and had a lift kit on it. So it was, it was pretty high. So I would have guessed it probably had been eight foot, nine foot tall, but it, it was, it was big. It was massive. And I never did go back to look for it. And, uh, I'm just, I'm glad that both of us saw it. I never did go out deer hunting after that for probably three or four years till I mean, like the sun was way up in the sky, but, uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't go out to like 10 o'clock in the morning and I got in way before dark, but, uh, I did go back there every once in a while. I would just go back and walk along the creek and, you know, look for signs and see if there was any, but I never did see anything, but then I don't really know what I'm looking for either, you know? It had kind of a, a elongated head, and it it was just tall, and it was massive. I mean, muscular, I guess is a better way to put it, but it, it was huge. And, you know, compared to anything else that you would see. And, you know, like, we have a pretty good population of black bear up here. And, you know, occasionally, you know, you see those, and I guess sometimes they walk on on their back legs but the thing that kind of set this was apart was that it stepped across the ditch and then stepped across barbed wire fence and i don't think he you know i don't think he would see a bear do that and i've seen a lot of times i've seen deer stand up like if they're you know in an orchard and maybe there's some apples you know i've seen them stand up and eat that and i've seen them stand up and eat uh, berries off dogwood trees and stuff like that but but this was totally different compared to that i mean this this thing was walking like a person first i just i didn't even say anything i just i I just kept driving and my wife said what was that and i said what was what and she said well you know you saw that and i said yeah I, i said i did but i have no clue what it could be and we just kind of figured you know that it almost had to be a Bigfoot. But then that kind of got me interested in it. And after we moved from there, I got on the Internet, and I was kind of looking at different stuff. And they um, had a um, recording of what they had thought was a Bigfoot out like in Washington or Northern California or someplace. And I played that, and I didn't realize that I had the volume up loud (laughs) and and when it came on my wife came in there and she said what was that and I said well what do you think it was and she said I don't know but it sounded just like what I heard that night on the creek I've talked to some other guys you know uh, one guy I was telling the story to and he spends basically his life in the woods I mean if he's if he's not out either you know with a bow or out rifle hunting he he's usually out just up in a tree stand somewhere kind of scouting things out to see where the animals are you know and i told him about it and he said oh i just don't think there's anything to that because he said people would find clues or or something you know and he actually lives on a river and so I, I didn't really, you know, pursue it because it's like, well, he doesn't believe what I'm saying. So, but then about a year later, I was telling that story to somebody else and he happened to be there. And he said, well, you know, he said, if, if these things were like down around a river, they'd have caves to get into and they would have water right there at the river and they could always find something to eat. And I thought, now I wonder what he's seen, you know, in <laughs> in the last year. And so I was asking him about it. I said, so what what have you seen? And he said, oh, nothing. I was just thinking about it. You know, it, it's possible around a river they could survive, you know. But as far as Bigfoot goes, I, I was kind of like everybody else, you know. It's, it's like you hear about them. And I was kind of the same way, you know. I was thinking why hasn't somebody found something kind of concrete, you know, that would support that. But you kind of, 
I don't know. You kind of want to think that it's possible, you know. But then I got to thinking, in in Missouri, I don't know how it is where you're at, but um, there's like now this is this is taking into account bow season, rifle season, uh, the alternative methods that, like for deer season. There's there's like four million deer killed in in a season, you know, and but you really don't see deer all that often. But if there's four million of them that are killed, and you know it doesn't really make a dent in the population, how many deer are there in Missouri? And so I got to thinking, you know, if there if there wasn't a whole lot of these things, and they had some type of intelligence and they didn't want to be seen they probably just wouldn't be seen you know and and this thing really did look like it was surprised when the when the headlights hit it so i'm thinking that that the way it was thinking was is hey it's early in the morning there's not going to be anybody out here and then when the lights hit it it just really had a shocked look on its face and then there was like one step across the ditch and then one step across the barbed wire fence. But since that time, there's a guy here in town that's a chiropractor. And I found out later, that was after we moved here, that he had written several articles on uh, Bigfoot that have been seen here. So it, it's kind of interesting. And then for the old Andy Griffith show, the family on there that played music, the Darling family, they're actually from the same town that I'm in. And I didn't realize this either until I got to kind of looking into it. And I was actually talking to one of them. They, they recorded a song there on the Andy Griffith show. They were uh, the Darling family, but their last names uh, are Dillard. And so they were telling me about the, some of the albums that they recorded and stuff. And one of the songs that they recorded, you might want to look this up. I think it's on YouTube. It's called The, the Biggest Whatever. And they talked to a guy that lives outside town here that actually saw this. I guess him and his wife saw one. Now, this was a long, long time ago. But he didn't know what it was, so he just called it the biggest whatever. And so they wrote a song around it and recorded it. But there's a there's a big conservation area not far from here. It's like 13,000 acres. And uh, they say that they've seen several out there. When we moved in, there was an older guy that lived back behind us, and I was talking to him about the house. And he said that at the time that he built his house, it was the first house here, and that where our house was at, he used to have some hogs that he ran in here. And so after, you know, every once in a while something would happen, and I asked him one time, I said, hey, the, the people that originally built this house, which it was built like in the late 50s, I said, are they still alive? And he said, oh, yeah, they were they." They live in a nursing home now. He gave me the name of the nursing home, wherever it was at. So there, there's not really anything like that that you could attribute it to, you know? It's kind of strange. We just have strange things happen in the house. We have hardwood floors, and sometimes you'll hear it sounds like a ball rolling down the hall. We've had stuff that has been leaning against a wall that will just fall out in the middle of the floor but it's never been anything that's been dangerous it's just it's just odd stuff you know but i did download uh one time there there's some app i don't know it's called ghost detector or something and i went over to the cemetery one time because my wife's family is buried over there and um uh, I was just kind of messing around, and she's got she's got a brother that was a little younger than me that passed away, and I put I put it on his tombstone, but I didn't say anything. I just laid it there, and he actually had a um, embolism. He was alone, and this thing got into his lungs, and he was actually able to call nine one one. But by the time they got there, they couldn't do anything. So she and I had been over there 
Memorial Day, and we just walked over there to put some flowers on on the graves, and I laid that down, and uh, it came it came across. His name was his name was Bo, and uh, it came across, went off, and I went and looked, and it said suffocated. That's kind of weird, and uh, then. I didn't say anything. I just left it laying there, and it uh, said Monica. Well, he has a daughter named Monica. It's like, I think we better go home. I had had that happen a couple of other times. The town that I grew up in, that's where all my, my folks are buried. And Mom and Dad had a daughter that was stillborn between me and my older sister. And so on Memorial Day, I usually go down there and, you know, put some flowers out. And where her, it's just a small tombstone, you know, for for a baby. And where I thought she was at, I was actually in the wrong part of the cemetery. And But I had this thing on. And uh, when we moved into town, there was uh, an older couple that lived down the street from us. His name was Charlie, and his wife's name was Mandy. And we'd we'd live next door, door to him, you know, forever. And I didn't know that they had ever had any kids. And so anyway, I'm walking through here, and I I was in the wrong part of the cemetery, and. I was just actually one section off, but I was walking along and there was a small headstone like for a kid. And I thought, well, that's it. So I walked up there and it it was actually two twin girls that it said daughters of Charlie and Mandy. They had died. They were, they had been stillborn too, or they, they only lived like a month. I was, I was looking at that and I thought, well, I didn't even know, that they had any kids and while i'm standing there looking at it it went off and it said horrible and then it said charles nobody ever called him charles you know i mean i guess like legal documents and stuff but everybody called him charlie so i thought that was kind of odd too since that time i've deleted that app it's like i I don't want anything following me home First off, I just love the fact that him and his wife had this experience together. I think that kind of justifies the situation and kind of makes it feel more real. Not saying that if he was by himself, it wouldn't be as believable, but the fact that they are together and that she had another experience before that, it's just really, it's a really neat story. Well, and I just think about the times I've been driving on the road when it's kind of dark out and you see like maybe a deer or something, you know, you almost pass it so quickly that you're like, oh, did I see something? But for them both to have seen it and like to have remembered it so vividly, I mean, I just think that that puts like so much weight on the experience, you know? And like you said, how many times have we been driving and a deer has crossed in front of us and you you know, that's a deer. This thing had to be so huge and, and different, unlike anything you've seen, any animal you've seen. And you're like, what the hell is going on? (laughs) (laughs) Well, and you know, if you listen back, what he says is we just, neither of us said anything at first. (laughs) He said he wanted to, he was just waiting. And then his wife was the first one to speak up and be like, uh, did you see that? I mean, I can just like imagine being in that situation with my husband. (laughs) And then also to have this other amazing paranormal type experience to go along with your amazing Bigfoot experience is just a double whammy for me. I mean, for something like that to happen that you can't deny that it's real. I mean, you can't deny that this is way too connected to what has gone on in his life to not be accurate. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the, what he said, like, you know, he deleted the app not too long after those experiences. Cause he just isn't the kind of person to want to invite that sort of thing in. And I think that that's really good advice, you know, sort of like how we used to be watching, you know, all those ghost shows in high school, like growing up, 
you know, at some point we had to be like, okay, we need to limit our watching of this because it's <laughs> raising it's our anxiety. Our life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that there's like a point if you can control sort of your um, interaction with the paranormal or that sort of thing, you know, it's best to kind of do so. I don't think that God or whatever you believe in, you know, wants us to dwell on the dead or the past if, if we don't have to. And I do have a funny story to wrap things up real quick. Uh, and hopefully our listeners find it as funny as we do. But as I was, uh, I found it hilarious <laughs> as I was getting ready to interview Alan, uh, you know, if you haven't told a story in here before, here's how it works. Madeline will like send me a name and a phone number, <laughs> not a lot of other info. And, um, I will call the person. Well, as I'm literally about to dial the number, I'm like, Madeline, what's his name? You didn't tell me. And she types back A M E N, Amen. I'm like, okay, interesting name. But you know, these days there are some interesting names out there. So I just go with it. I dial the number and he answers. And I say, hey, this is Caitlin with the Unrest podcast. Um, and I literally said, um, <laughs> because I'm like, hopefully this is really his name. And I'm not really sure how to say it, but I'm just going to wing it. And I said, um, is this Amen? And he was like, uh, Alan. <laughs> I was like, I am so sorry. Madeline had a bit of a typo when she told me who to call. But sorry, the, Alan. That's just the fun we have here. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a story that you think our listeners would love to hear, please email us at the unrest podcast at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Facebook. We have a Facebook group as well, where we have lots of fun, interactive, extra content. And we're on TikTok too. So follow us over there. And until next time, unrest, unrest in peace. peace.